Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Each week we bring to life the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. This week we return to the timeless collection of tales known as A Thousand and One Nights. Like Aladdin, which we have also done on this channel, this story wasn't in the earliest editions of that collection, so it probably developed outside of that, but it was instead probably included by Antoine Galland in his seminal translation, along with Aladdin, Ali Baba, and some other stories. This shouldn't take away from the importance of this story, though. It is still ancient and wonderful, and the inspiration for writers, filmmakers, and creatives across the world. Sinbad had seven voyages, each time meeting challenges, monsters, tragedy, and fortune. This time we will hear the first three of his tales of wonder. So, pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy part one of Sinbad the Sailor. Sinbad the Sailor in the time of Harun ur Rashid, there was in Baghdad a rich merchant named Sinbad the Sailor, the source of whose wealth was a mystery. It seemed to be inexhaustible. For long seasons he kept open house, and his entertainments were the most magnificent of all, save only those of ur Rashid himself. All that riches could buy seemed at his disposal, and he lavished the good things of this life upon his guests. Pages, slaves and attendants there were in great number. His garden was spacious and beautiful, and his house was filled with every costly luxury. This Sinbad the sailor has a story to tell, the story of his life, but he never told it to any, until one day there came to him one Sinbad the landsman, a man of poor and humble birth. This man pleased him greatly with an apt recitation dealing with the widely different lots dispensed by God to men, and being pleased, he was struck with the happy conceit that, now Simbad the sailor was at last confronted with Simbad the landsman, it would be no bad thing were he to narrate the story of his life, so that all might know his strange adventures and conjecture no longer as to the source of his fabulous wealth. Accordingly, Simbad the sailor held seven receptions on seven different days, and although on each occasion a multitude of guests was assembled to listen, he failed not to address his words from first to last to his simple listener, Simbad the landsman. Following is his narration of the strange and wonderful adventures he experienced in his seven voyages. The first voyage of Sinbad the Sailor. My father was a merchant of high rank and rich possessions. He died when I was but a child, leaving me all his wealth. When I reached a manhood's estate, I used my inheritance with no thought for the morrow, living in a sumptuous manner and consorting with the richest young men of Baghdad. I continued this life for many years until, at last, when reason prevailed with me to mend my plan, I found with dismay that I had sunk to poverty. And then it was that I arose and sold what goods remained to me for three thousand pieces of silver, and girded myself, resolving to travel to other lands and rebuild my fortune by the wit of my mind and the labour of my hands. With a part of my hoard, I bought merchandise for exchange in far lands, and also such things as I should require in my travels. Thus prepared, I set sail with a company of merchants in a ship bound for the city of El Basra. For many days and nights we sailed upon the sea, visiting islands and passing thence to other islands, and everywhere we bartered and bought and sold. At length we came to an island unlike the others. It seemed like a garden that had floated from the sides of paradise and established itself in the sea. And here our ship cast anchor and we landed. Then fires were lighted, and while some cooked, others washed in the cool stream, and yet others amused themselves admiring the beauties of the place. When all had eaten of the food prepared, the shore became a gay scene of sport and play, in which I engaged to the full. But suddenly... A cry from the master of the ship put an end to our gaiety. Standing at the side of the vessel, he called loudly, Hear me, and may God preserve you. 
Hasten back and leave everything. Save yourselves from sudden death, for this that ye think is an island is not such. It is a mighty fish, lying entranced in sleep on the surface of the sea since times of old, and trees have grown upon it. But your fires and your frolicking have awakened it, and lo, it moves, and if it sink into the sea, ye will assuredly be drowned. Hasten then, and save yourselves. At this, we all, with one accord, left everything and fled for the ship, hoping to escape with our lives. While we were making for safety, the island moved with a great turmoil and sank behind us in the sea, and the waves leapt against each other above it. For a time I gave myself up as lost, for I was drawn down fathoms deep, but by God's grace I rose again to the surface, and to my hand was one of the large wooden bowls which some of the passengers had taken on shore for the purpose of washing. This I seized, and established myself in it, and thus combated the leaping waves, steadying myself with my hands and feet. In vain I called on the master of the ship. He heard me not. He had spread his sails and pursued his way, thinking that none besides those who had been taken up were left alive. Astride my wooden bowl, I gazed longingly at the ship until it was out of sight. Then I prepared for death as the night was closing around me. Perchance I swooned, for I remember naught else until I found myself stranded upon a mountainous island. There were trees overhanging, and I grasped a drooping bough and drew myself up from the fretting wave. My limbs were benumbed, and on looking at my legs I saw the marks made by the nibbling teeth of fish, and marvelled at my salvation from death. Staggering forward, I flung myself high on the beach like one dead, and so I remained until the dawn of the next day, when the sun rising upon me woke me to a sense of such a condition as I have never known before. Long, long it was before I could rise to a sitting posture, and longer still before I could crawl on my hands and knees to a space of grass that was shielded from the sun. Thence in time I staggered, till I came to a brook of which I drank, and strength returned to me. I found luscious fruits and ate of them, and drank again of the clear waters of the brook, and so I continued many days, roaming the island and wandering at its beauties, until I was strong again as before. And it chanced as I took my way to and fro in the island, revelling in the sight of things that God had set there, that on a day when the sea was sounding loudly on the shore, I beheld something in the distance which excited my curiosity. It seemed like a wild animal of gigantic size, and as I approached, I feared it was some fabulous beast of the sea. But as I drew still nearer, I was overcome with amazement to see a beautiful mare standing high with mane and tail floating on the breeze. She was tethered to a stake on the shore, and at sight of me she screamed loudly and stamped her forefeet on the sand, but ere I turned to flee, I beheld a man came forth from a cave nearby, and he ran after me, calling on me to give an account of myself and my presence in that place. Thereupon I laid my story before him, sparing no detail, even to the wooden bowl by means of which, and the grace of God, I had come hither. Gladness seized him at my recital, and he shook my hand, saying, Come with me. He led me into his cave and set food before me. I ate until I was satisfied, and being at my ease, I repeated my story more minutely, and he wondered thereat. Then I said, Thou hast the truth of my adventures upon the sea. Now I pray thee, O my master, tell me who thou art, that thou dwellest hidden in a cave while thy mare is tethered on the shore. He was in no way displeased at my curiosity, but answered me in plain words. I am one of the grooms of the King El Miraj, he said, and the others are scattered about the island. For, look you, friend, it is the time of the new moon, when the seahorse cometh up out of the sea, and it is our plan to bring our best mares hither and tether them by the shore, so that they may lure the seahorses into our hands. While I was wondering at the manner of this cunning device, a magnificent seahorse rose from the waves, shaking the foam from its crest and neighing loudly. 
As it approached, my companion drew me into the cave and placed himself at the opening with a long coil of thick cord in his hand. Presently, by means of this, he leashed the seahorse with great dexterity and fettered him and subdued him. Then, with the mare and the seahorse, he led me to his companions, who, when they had heard my story, were all of one mind that I should accompany them to the city of the king. So they mounted me on one of the mares, and I rode with them to the king's palace. As soon as we had arrived at the palace gates, they went in to the king and informed him of my strange adventures, whereupon he sent for me, and they led me before him. He greeted me very courteously, and bade me tell him my story, which, when he had heard it, filled him with amazement, so that he cried, "'By Allah, my son, of a truth thou art favoured by fate, for how else couldst thou escape so great a peril? Praise God for thy deliverance!' And he made much of me, and caused me to be treated with honour, and he appointed me master of the harbour and comptroller of the shipping. My condition then was no longer that of a wayfarer. I rose day by day to a higher and a higher place in the king's favour, and he took me into his council in all affairs of state. For a long time I served him well, and he ceased not to recompense me with a liberal hand. Yet my thoughts turned ever to Baghdad, the abode of peace. But when I inquired of merchants and travellers and masters of ships in which direction it lay, and how one might come at it, they one and all shook their heads at the name of a strange city of which they had never heard. At last, weary of the wonders of that island and the sea around it, wonders the which, if I had time to tell you, would cause you the greatest amazement, wearied too with my arduous duties, but most of all with my prolonged absence from my own land. I stood one day on the seashore when a great ship drew near and a number of merchants landed from it. The sailors brought forth their merchandise, and when I had made an account of it, I inquired of the master of the ship if that were the whole of his cargo. "'All, O oh my master,' he replied, "'all save some bales whose owner was drowned on our voyage hither. But even these, being in my charge, I desire to sell on behalf of his family in Baghdad.' "'Sayest thou so?' I cried. "'Tell me, I, I pray thee, the name of the owner of these goods.' And he replied, "'His name was Sinbad the Sailor, and he was drowned on our way hither.' When I heard this, I regarded him more closely and recognised him. Then I cried out, "'Oh, my master, I am he, and they are my goods that are in thy hold.' but he neither recognised me nor believed my words, whereupon I narrated to him the history of my supposed death, but he shook his head and called upon Allah to witness that there was neither faith nor conscience in any. "'Look you,' he said, "'thou heardst me say the owner was dead, and therefore thou desirest the goods for thyself, free of price. I tell thee, we saw him sink into the sea with many others.' "'Oh, my master,' I answered, "'hear me, and then judge of my veracity.' With this I narrated to him many trivial things which happened before we reached the great fish island, and which could never be known to me had I not been on the ship. And then it was that he and many of the merchants regarded me with fixed looks, and recognised me. "'By Allah!' they said, one and all, "'we truly believed thou drowned!' But here we find thee alive. And they pressed upon me and congratulated me, and the master of the ship gave me my goods, at sight of which I was overjoyed, and they all rejoiced with me. Mindful of the king I served, I at once opened my bales, and selecting the most costly articles, went in to him and laid them at his feet, telling him how I had regained the goods of which they were a part. The king wondered greatly at my good fortune, and graciously accepted my gifts. He also showed me great favour and honour, in that he bestowed upon me gifts in return for mine. Then, having sold my remaining goods at a profit, I bought largely of the merchandise of the city, and when the ship was about to sail, I approached the king and thanked him for his great kindness to me, and humbly begged his leave to depart to my own city and family. So he gave me his blessing, and a great wealth of merchandise and rare commodities, and bade me farewell. And soon thereafter, having stowed all my goods in the hold of the ship, I set sail with the others for Baghdad. 
Our voyage was fortunate, and with the aid of favourable winds, we reached the city of El Basra in safety. Thence I repaired to Baghdad, and my family and my friends gave me a joyous welcome. And when I had sold my merchandise, I set up a large establishment, sparing no cost, and I bought land and houses, and gathered round me wealthy companions, in whose society I soon forgot the dangers and terrors I had suffered in other lands. Such is the story of my first voyage. And tomorrow, by God's grace, I will narrate to you the strange adventures of my second voyage. The Second Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor As I related yesterday, I was living here in Baghdad in the midst of every delight, surrounded by companions after my own heart. But a time came when the wandering spirit seized me again, and I longed for the sight, even for the perils, of other and unknown lands. This, and the fact that I had decreased my substance by large expenditure, led me to adventure a second time, at once to relieve the monotony of life and to replenish my exhausted store. The step was quickly taken. Having collated suitable merchandise, I repaired to the river and, without a word to anyone, embarked on a new ship, finely rigged and manned by a large crew. Together with a goodly party of merchants, I sailed away, and we passed over the deep from island to island and from sea to sea, with fair winds filling the sails. And at every place at which we cast anchor, we bought and sold and bartered. So we continued until we came to an uninhabited island of great beauty. The trees hung with ripe fruits, birds of bright plumage flew hither and thither over the shining foliage, and their songs were heard in the topmost branches. Rare flowers laid their scent upon the breeze, and pure clear streams coursed everywhere. When we landed, we fell to extolling these master touches of the Creator's hand, for, indeed, the place was, as it were, born of fragrant musk, so fresh and beautiful and full of all delights not made by man. Selecting a rare spot on the bank of a stream, I sat apart, meditating upon the wonderful works of the Omnipotent One. There, the soft zephyrs singing in the trees, and the stream murmuring at my feet, lulled me to slumber. And when I awoke later, I looked forth upon the sea, and lo, the ship was far out on the wall of the ocean sloping to the sky. They had forgotten me, and I was left alone on the island. Despair fell upon me as I gazed around and realised I was desolate, and I said within myself, what if I escaped from dangers in the past when all seemed lost? It still remains that here at least there is no escape. Then I blamed myself for leaving my comfortable life in Baghdad to undertake this voyage, for here there was neither strong food nor strong drink, nor rich apparel, nor gold, nor goods. As I pondered to the point of madness on these things, a restless spirit came upon me, and I ran to and fro in the island, retracing my steps and crossing them, but I found naught to lessen my despair. At last I climbed to the top of a high tree, and looking forth in every direction, saw only sky and sea and trees and watercourses. As I gazed, however, my eye reverted again and again to an object in a distant part of the island. It was round and white and of enormous size. This aroused my curiosity, and I resolved to find out what it was. Having marked its position, I descended from the tree and made my way towards it. When I reached it, I found to my astonishment that it was a gigantic dome, white and shining. My first thought was to walk round it, to ascertain if there were some door or opening, but none could I find in its whole circumference, which was about fifty paces. While I was meditating on some means to gain an entrance to this strange structure, behold the sky darkened, and on looking toward the sinking sun, I saw it was hidden by a great black cloud, an unwanted thing, as it was the summer season. While I continued to gaze, the object drew rapidly clearer, and now I could discern in it the shape of a monstrous bird approaching swiftly through the air, 
and this it was that blotted out the sun. Marvelling greatly, I recalled a story told by travellers about certain islands where was found a bird of immense size called the Ruck, which fed its young on elephants. It was then that I knew that the great white dome I had discovered was one of this bird's eggs, at which, not the least of the creator's works, I wondered greatly. Then, while I so wondered, the giant bird alighted over the egg, and crouching down, spread its wings and brooded over it, and composed itself to sleep. Here, thought I, was a chance of escaping from the island. Unfolding my turban, I twisted it into a rope, and bound one end of it tightly about my waist. Then I approached the bird cautiously, and fastened the other end securely to one of its feet, for thus, when it flew away, it might perchance bear me through the air to some inhabited region. The whole night long I lay awake, thinking of my projected flight, but it was not until morning that the bird awoke, and with a loud cry rose from the egg, bearing me aloft, higher and higher it soared, until I thought it must reach the stars. Then, gradually, in vast circles, it descended, and finally came to earth on a high tableland. In great fear lest the bird should discover my presence, I made haste to loosen the turban from its foot, and having done so, I crept away, trembling in every limb. Then, as I watched the bird from a distance, I observed it pick something from the ground, and soar away with it clutched in its talons, and I looked again, and I saw that it was an enormous serpent twisting and writhing in the grasp of the bird as it flew swiftly towards the sea. And at this strange thing I wondered greatly as I folded my turban. But what desert place had I come to by this daring misadventure? On the one side of the tableland was a deep valley, and on the other a steep mountain which no foot of man could climb. Had I only remained in the island, I should at least have fruit to eat and water to drink, but here was nothing but desolation from which I had no hope of escape. There was no course but to descend into the valley, and this I did, little caring whither I went. Now I had not walked therein but a few furlongs when I observed that the ground I trod was strewn with diamonds of large size, but, and this gave me cause for wild alarm, coiled here and there amongst the stones were gigantic serpents such as the one I had seen the bird bear away in its talons. As soon as I was aware of these sleeping serpents, which were of the same hue as the ground whereon they lay, I stepped warily, lest I should awaken them and be devoured. In this way was I proceeding down that valley, my flesh quaking and my knees a-tremble, when suddenly the flayed carcass of a slaughtered beast fell with a great noise before me. This aroused a great wonder in my mind, and also called to my recollection a story I had heard in my youth from a merchant traveller who had visited lands whence none else had ever come to deny the truth of it, a story confirmed by others who claimed a reputation for wide knowledge and feared to lose it. It was this that in a far land where diamonds are as thickly strewn as the venomous serpents and other deadly perils which render it difficult to come at them, the daring merchants who seek these precious stones employ a cunning stratagem. They take a beast and slaughter it on the heights above the valley, and having skinned it and lacerated the flesh, they throw it down. And when it reaches the bottom of the valley, whereon the diamonds lie, the stones adhere to the moist flesh. From the depths of the sky descends the watching vulture of the giant kind, and this bird, seizing the carcass in its talons, soars with it to the mountain tops, whereupon the merchants spring out and frighten the bird away with loud cries, and then take the stones adhering to the meat and bear them to their own country. I had my whole life long regarded this story with a half-shut eye, but now, beholding the slaughtered beast before me, and guessing full well the meaning of its presence there, I said within myself, By Allah, no marvel is past belief, for here is the verification. I surveyed that carcass, and having measured in a glance the distance to the mountains whence it had descended, I gazed into the blue sky in whose depths lurked the watching vulture. A plan of escape 
then came to me, and I hastened to put it into operation. First, I gathered as many diamonds as I could well dispose within my garments. Then, unfolding my turban, I approached the slaughtered beast, and, lying on my back, drew it over me and bound myself firmly to it. I had not lain long in that position, with the heavy weight of the beast upon me, when a monstrous vulture came out of the sky, and, seizing upon the carcass with a loud scream, gripped it in its powerful talons, and rose up and away with it and me, and it rose higher and higher, with a mighty flapping of its wings, until at last it alighted on a broad ledge near the summit of the mountain, a place which, judging by the bleached bones lying on every hand, was the favourite feeding place of these birds. This was clearly known to the merchant who had cast the carcass down, for no sooner had the vulture deposited his burden and started to tear at the flesh than he sprang out with loud cries and scared it away. Half smothered by the weight of the slaughtered beast, I lost no time in freeing myself, and soon I struggled to my feet and stood there with my clothes stained and polluted with its blood. When the merchant saw me, his fear was great, but his disappointment was even greater when, his fear mastered by the lust of gain, he turned the carcass over and found no diamonds sticking to the flesh. Pitying him in his sad case, for he was smiting hand on hand and calling out against fate, I advanced and said, "'Curse not fate!' nor fear me, for I am of thy kind, and I hear with me an abundance of these stones, the loss of which thou lamentest, and they are of the largest that a man can carry up borne by a vulture's wings. Of these I will give unto thee, therefore forget thy fear, and bury thy disappointment. On hearing this, the merchant thanked me, and prayed fervently for me and my family, and he ceased not to pray for the prolongation of my life until I had bestowed upon him the largest diamonds I could find within my garments. While he was thanking me for this, there came his companions, each of whom had cast down a carcass, and when they had heard the story of my escape, they congratulated me, and bade me come with them, for they said, "'By Allah, thou art greatly favoured by fate!' since none but thee hath been in that valley and escaped to tell the tale. After my perilous adventures and my despairing sojourn into the Valley of Serpents, I was filled with the utmost joy at finding my fellow mortals around me, and seeing this, they made me welcome among them, and I partook of their food and wine. We passed the night in a safe place, and when morning came, we set forth over the mountain ranges overlooking the Valley of the Serpents, and at length descended to a stretch of sea. This we crossed by means of the boats which they had moored upon the shore, and came thus to a low-lying island where grew camphor trees in abundance, each of which might shield a hundred men from the sun. Here too, upon the plains, roamed the wild rhinoceros, of which wonderful tales are told by people who return from unknown lands. This beast impales an elephant upon its horn with ease, and wanders thus, with little hindrance to its pasturing, until the fat of the elephant, melting in the heat of the sun and flowing down into its eyes, renders it blind, whereupon it seeks the seashore and lies down until such time as the rock may find it, and carry both it and the elephant away as a morsel for its young. But I speak of what I know, and as I saw naught of this kind, I can but say that I know not." I continued with my companions for some space, journeying from island to island and exchanging the diamonds we had acquired for rich merchandise, and in passing through many countries unheard of in this city, I separated from them and went my way, coming at length to El Basra with a princely cargo of goods. Thence I journeyed to Baghdad, the abode of peace, and rejoined my family. Wealth I had in abundance, and I resorted to my former life of luxury, bestowing gifts and alms, wearing rich apparel, and eating and drinking with my companions. This is the story of my second voyage, and by the grace of God, whose name be exalted, I will narrate tomorrow the still more remarkable adventures that befell me on my third voyage. The Third Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor Having rested for a space in Baghdad, where I lived surrounded by every happiness and delight, I began again to experience that restless desire for travel and commerce which had drawn me forth on my former voyages. 
When the desire grew so great that I could no longer withstand it, I set out with a large stock of merchandise and arrived at the city of El Basra, where I took ship together with a goodly companion of merchants and others of high standing and repute. For many days we sailed outwards, buying and selling among the islands, until one day, while we were in the midst of the ocean, a storm descended upon us and blew the ship out of its course. The wind continued from one quarter with great violence, and for a day and night we were hurled before it. When morning came, it abated, and the master of the ship looked forth on every hand to ascertain where we were. Suddenly he uttered a loud cry and plucked his beard. "'God preserve us!' he said. "'The gale hath driven us to an evil fate. See, yonder is the mountain of apes. None hath ever come near it and escaped.' We looked and beheld a high mountain on an island, and while we were gazing at it, and wondering where lay the danger at so great a distance, beheld the sea around us was swarming with apes which had swum out from the island. They were hideous black beasts, not of large size, but of malignant aspect, and so great was their number that we were powerless to stand against them. They climbed up the sides of the ship and seized upon the ropes, which they severed with their sharp teeth, so that the sails were were powerless and the vessel drifted with tide and wind to the shore. There we were seized by the apes and set on the land, after which they returned to the ship and bent fresh ropes and set the sails and departed over the sea we knew not whither. But we ceased to wonder at the manner of their going, for we were in a desperate plight, since all sailors feared the mountain of apes and no ship would ever approach the island to rescue us. In our wanderings through the island, eating of its fruit and drinking of its streams, we came at length to an open space in which stood a house of gigantic size. The walls and the folding doors of ebony were very lofty, and when we walked into an immense apartment, for the doors were open, we found everything within it of a corresponding size. The cooking utensils were large enough to cook an ox whole, and on the couch at the upper end a hundred men might sit with comfort but no occupant we could ever find. So we seated ourselves and rested for a while, and then we slept. It was about sunset when we were wakened suddenly by a loud noise and a trembling of the earth, and lo, we beheld coming from the further end of the apartment a gigantic being in the shape of a man. His skin was black and his eyes blazed like fire. Two gleaming tusks protruded from his great mouth, his enormous ears drooped to his shoulders, and his nails were like the sharp claws of a beast of prey. We were stricken with great fear at the approach of this frightful being, so that we could neither move nor cry out while he advanced to the couch and disposed his huge limbs thereon. Then, on turning his head, he caught sight of us, and arose and came towards us. As I was nearest to his hand, he seized me, and taking me from the ground, turned me over and over in his palm, feeling my limbs to see if they were fat. But by the grace of God, whose name be exalted, I was lean, and wasted with fatigue and affliction, so he set me down and seized another, whom he turned over and felt in the same manner. He too was lean, and he let him go, but he took one after another until he came to the master of ship, a big man, and fat. With him he was satisfied. Then, seeing what he was about to do, we hid our eyes and did not look again until the ogre, having cooked and eaten our master, threw his bones upon a heap of others on one side of the apartment. Afterwards he arose and laid himself down upon the couch and slept, and his snoring was like the roll of thunder. We crept forth from that house in terror, feeling that it were happier to be killed by apes or drowned in the sea than to be roasted on live coals. A terrible death for a man. We then considered means of hiding or escaping from the place, but there was no place to hide, and the ship, our only way of escape, was gone. While we were lamenting, a spell seemed to be cast over us, so that our very excess of fear drew us back to the ogre's house, wherein we sat as before and slept. Again we were awakened by the thunder of the ogre's approach, and again he came and selected one of our number. 
When, having eaten, he slept upon the couch, we conversed together, thinking to find some way of escape. One said, "'By Allah! By Allah! Let us kill him!' And he proposed a plan. "'Listen, O my brothers,' I said on hearing this, "'if we seek to kill him, let us first prepare some rafts on which to escape, for we may fail of our purpose, and on these rafts we can at worst be drowned, which is better than being roasted.' They answered me, "'Thou art right!' So we set to work, and gathered stout pieces of wood, and carried them to the seashore, where we constructed rafts and stowed food upon them in readiness for a hasty departure. Then we returned to the giant's house to carry out our plan. The sound of his snoring told us that he still slept, so we took two sharp-pointed iron spits and heated the points of red hot in the fire. Then we approached him cautiously, and at a given signal thrust the red-hot points one into each of his eyes, and bore upon the spits with our combined weight. He arose with a mighty roar, and we fled right and left, for his sight being destroyed, we feared his blind rage. He searched for us, but not finding us, he groped for the door, and went forth, uttering loud cries which shook the earth. In great haste and lashed by mortal fear, we gained the seashore and launched the rafts. But scarcely had we gained the water when we saw the ogre approaching, led by a female more gigantic and more hideous than himself. We swam out, pushing the rafts before us, but they hurled great rocks after us, and many of our number were killed. Three alone, including myself, escaped, and after much stress and peril reached another island. We had gained at length what seemed to us a place of safety, high and dry above the wave and far from the ogre's domain, and there, when night came on, we slept, but only to awaken to fresh terrors. Lo, in the act of coiling round us was a serpent of enormous size, its folds contracted and its head raised to strike. At sight of this, another and myself were more nimble than our companion, for we sprang clear of the serpent's embrace while he was seized in the huge jaws and slowly swallowed with a horrible crackling of bones. And we mourned our companion and went thenceforth in fear for ourselves. Dreading to sleep again on the ground, we climbed a high tree, and binding ourselves each in a safe position with our turbans, we slept fitfully. But alas... God hath given to all serpents the wisdom of the evil one. That night the serpent mounted the tree, and seizing my companion proceeded to swallow him while I looked on in helpless fear. Then in descending the tree it coiled its vast bulk around the trunk, and I heard my companion's bones crack within its paunch. When morning had come, I descended from the tree, feeling that my safest course was to drown myself in the waves, for well, where else could I hide that the serpent could not find me? But life is sweet, and I pondered long upon a cunning plan to protect myself. Then, repairing to the seashore, I selected some pieces of wood from the raft and took them to a dry place. Towards evening, when I had eaten of the fruits of the island and drunk of its streams, I bound a long piece of wood crosswise upon the soles of my feet, and another crosswise upon my head. I secured a wide flat piece to my right side, and another to my left side, and another to the front of my body, and there, having thrust my arms under the side pieces, I lay encased. And as the evening wore on, the serpent saw me and draw near, but it could not swallow me because of the pieces of wood. All through the night it tried to come at me, attempting in all ways to effect its purpose, but in every way it failed, while I lay like a dead man, gazing in speechless horror at the terrible creature, and it ceased not in its efforts to engulf me until morning broke, when it went its way consumed with rage and vexation. Then I freed myself from the pieces of wood and arose trembling in every limb, but thanking God for my deliverance, for, look you, I was sorely tried by what I had endured from that serpent. Not many hours later, I had the good fortune to espy a ship far out upon the sea, and as it was making as if to pass a headland on the island somewhat closely, I ran with all speed and established myself in the furthest point. 
There I waved my unfolded turban to attract the notice of those on the vessel. At last they saw me and came and took me on board. They listened to my story with great astonishment and congratulated me on my escape. Then they gave me clean raiment and set food and drink before me so that I was revived and comforted. And as we proceeded on our way, I was emboldened to look back on all I had suffered as nothing more than a terrible dream. In the course of our journey, we came to an island where the sandalwood grows, and here I landed with the other merchants, but they had goods to sell, whereas I, alas, had none. Then, strange to relate, the same kind providence that had befriended me on my first voyage was at my service once more, and in the same guise. The master of the ship, seeing me without merchandise, came to me and, taking compassion upon my poor condition, told me of some goods in the hold which belonged to a man whom they had lost during the voyage. He offered me these goods to sell upon the island, so that when an account had been rendered to the owner's family in Baghdad, there would be a recompense for my trouble and service. I thanked him gladly for this, and he ordered the goods be brought up and landed on the island, and lo, when I saw the bales, I knew them, and showed how they were marked with the name of Simbad the sailor. Then, seeing that they were perplexed, I shouted in my excitement, Do you not hear me? I am Simbad the sailor, and these are my goods. While some believed and others doubted, I related my story from the time I had awakened upon the island to find myself alone, and when I mentioned the Valley of Diamonds, a merchant came forward and confirmed my words, for it was he whose slaughtered beast had helped me to safety. Hear me, ye doubters, he said. When I related this very thing to you, you believed me not, but see, this is the man I spoke of. Now you have it independently from his own mouth. Learn from this, O my brothers, never while living doubt a true tale, because it is marvellous. Then the master asked me what was the distinguishing mark of my goods, and I replied that it was such and such a mark, and I also called to his mind some conversation between him and me before the ship left Al-Basra. He was then convinced that I was Sinbad the Sailor, and he congratulated me, and he embraced me, saying that my story was most extraordinary. The remainder of this, my third voyage, was occupied in buying and selling among the islands on the way to El Basra, where, in good time, laden with wealth and rich merchandise, I proceeded to Baghdad to dwell in peace once again, surrounded by my family and friends. Here, for a season, charmed with every delight, I forgot the perils and horrors I had endured. But the longing for travel and adventure found me again, impelling me to undertake a fourth voyage, and the events of this, more marvellous than those of the preceding voyages, O Simbad the Landsman, I will narrate to you tomorrow. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed listening to the first three voyages of Sinbad the Sailor. If you want access to more classic science fiction and fantasy stories, or if you just want to show your support for The Well Told Tale, please consider visiting The Well Told Tale Patreon page at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's also a link in the description. Please join me next week as we hear of Sinbad's other astonishing voyages. I hope you can join me.